talk about the status of the CS700 uh, towards the end. Um, just a review. Uh, this is the from last uh, from the last presentation. DMR is a worldwide standard for uh, digital voice. Um, it comes out of the old uh, Motorola, their commercial radios, um, known usually as Motorbo. Um, the interesting thing about it is it is a, a worldwide standard and there are multiple uh, companies that are making uh, DMR radios as opposed to D-Star which mainly ICOM is making that as opposed to the new Yezu Fusion which is mainly Yezu uh, so if you get a Yezu Fusion repeater you're stuck only the people who have Yezu Fusion can use it who have Yezu, Yezu Fusion radios can use it um, the, the DMR radios have mostly been expensive because they're high-end commercial stuff the Connect Systems came out with this $200 radio that a lot of us have. There are stories, there are reports that a couple of Chinese companies are going to be entering with uh, the market with radios that are even lower priced than the Connect Systems. So there will be a number of, of vendors driving the price down, mm -hmm. as opposed to DMR, as opposed to, um, to Yezu. So that's, that's the advantage of it. There are actually some other advantages to it over both Fusion and D-Star in that it uses uh, time division multiplexing which means you can have two stations operating on each repeater uh, and it's got better fidelity than either D-Star or Fusion so it's very interesting that way. Um, but it is nice because you can have two conversations going on each repeater. Think about that. Uh, anyway, it's growing, we know it's growing. Um, We know that D-Star right now is mainly ICOM. We know that D-Star has a fairly decent in base, but it's kind of, its growth has slowed. A couple of years ago it was growing like crazy. Its growth has slowed because nobody has come out with D-Star radios other than ICOM. ICOM's um, radios have been expensive. Uh, in part because they're using this proprietary chip that has uh, that they have to pay all sorts of fees for. Um, it's not their chip; it's somebody else's. But you have to use it to do D-Star. And um, and one other problem is that ICOM has never been known for really good HTs. ICOM HTs generally draw more current than non-ICOM HTs, and ICOM has always had a has had a continuing problem of its HTs drawing too much power and shutting off after a transmission. Um, you know, for example, I have, uh, I have the, the ICOM 91 AD piece of crap, and this thing shuts down after every transmission. If I transmit for more than 15 seconds at a time, the radio shuts itself off. When I sent it back to ICOM, they said, no, it's within spec. Yeah, we know it shuts off about 30% of the, 90, the uh, 91 and 92 ADs do that and there's nothing we can do about it, there's nothing we're going to do to fix it because it draws 2.2 amps and it just kills the battery. And my radio was drawing 2.2 amps and just, and I come said, well, we're not going to fix it. And that, that problem continues to this day with their newer D-Star uh, handhelds that a lot of people report a problem of the current draw is just too much. Yeah. And, it's, and it kills the battery, it shuts off, so anyway. Um, Right now, there's, right now you have to have a radio to talk on a DMR repeater, as opposed to D-Star where you can talk through your computer or you can talk through a dongle where you have something that you plug into your computer and then you can, you can go 150 feet away from your computer. With, with the DMR, there's none of that at this point. Okay, uh, it does, it's very nice that it only uses 12.5 kilohertz and it gives you two channels for that, which means we can go to tighter, um, spacing. tighter spacing. And since we're running out of usable channels, especially in the Northeast, that could be a very good thing. If we can get people, if you can get enough people to go with DMR. The, the problem, of course, is you've got two very different market forces at work here. On the one end, you've got the cheap analogs like Balfunk, you know, $25 for an HD. 
So a lot of people are going with the analog HD that's standard 25 kilohertz spacing uh, for one channel. And then you've got some, a smaller group of people going, I'm going to go DMR 12.5 and I get two channels. That's four times as many conversations. But, you know, you, you've, got, you've got a $200 radio. And uh, if any of you have been following it, the, n the number of people buying Baofengs is crazy. You know, it's just everybody's buying a Baofeng. What the hell for $25? And you get into these arguments where, you know, with the Baofengs where somebody says, well, you know, it's not a very good radio. It breaks down. So what? My Yezu VX6 costs $250. So that's what? Ten Baofengs. Right? <laughs> so I buy ten Baofengs. I, bu I buy five Baofengs, I've still got $125, right? You know, I'm still $125 to the, to the better, and if one of my Baofengs breaks, I go, yeah, okay, fine, next one. I don't have, you've got a whole bunch of extra batteries. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, chargers. <laughs> so it's a real, it's an interesting problem because because many, many, many people are buying these cheap, these cheap radios. Uh, so we're not going to get the world to convert to, to, to digital whether it's D-Star or, or DMR, we're not going to get the world to convert very quickly because this, this, this idea of the $25 radio is very, very uh, appealing to most people. I think one of the other questions might be how many repeaters are set up for the DMR? Well, that number is growing rapidly, especially in this area, um, but there are, you'll see, uh, we'll, do, we'll look at the map, there's still big holes. Uh, for example, there's much of the world that is not, doesn't have much in line of DMR at all. The U.S., um, there, are big, there are big areas that have a lot of DMR, and then there are big areas that have nothing. So, for example, Toronto recently got their first DMR repeater. You know, Toronto's a big city, a lot of people. They, first, they got, they, they got their, they, their first DMR repeater. It's up on top of uh, the CN Tower, or whatever it's called, with, so it's got a tremendous coverage, but it's the first one. So that's, that's a real issue. Um, versus, again, the analog, you've got all those analog repeaters sitting out there. And Echo Link is still a very viable solution for connecting uh, repeaters. So it's, it really comes down to, do you want to have fun with the, with the advanced digital stuff? What are the advantages of the advanced digital stuff versus Get a twenty-five dollar radio and you know and operate D-Star. I mean, operate analog with uh, um, uh, with Echo Link if you want to get get away from the local repeater. And that's a real, you know, real two real conflicting, competing marketing forces at play. The answer is, I think that the answer is because of that that huge mass of 20 people with the twenty-five dollar radios. We're not going to see digital take over anytime soon. We'll see a lot of growth in the digital. But, you, but people aren't going to be flocking to digital. The, the typical ham is not going to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go with DMR or you're D-Star. Talking, you're talking $200 for an HT. For an HT, right. 500 some yeah. power where you can reach it from a little further out. Then right now, you're talking about very expensive. Uh, the same people who are making the lower cost DMR rigs are talking about coming out with mobiles, 25 or 50 watt mobiles. So I think those will be coming in the next couple of years, and they're going to try to come in at price points at around $300. Uh, but again, uh, the T, you know, I can get a 50 watt TYT for 150 bucks, uh, an analog, two and 440 analog for 150 bucks. So you're still going to have that that compelling uh, marketing trend of lots of people saying, "I'm staying with analog." We're not going to see digital take over. So why use the digital? Digital has some advantages if you want to use digital. Um, in, in terms of pure technical concept, you have the, the packet. Um, you, you get the two conversations on a repeater. So if you, if you have a 2 and a 440, you get four conversations instead of two. Uh, let me find that other. Uh, Sorry, let me, that one. You get better signal quality for longer distance. So what this is saying is, this is the fall off of an analog, and this is the fall off of a typical digital. So when you're out with a lower signal strength, out in this area, 
where you might not be able to hear very well on the on the analog, you still have good digital coverage. <coughs> is that enough? No, but I mean, is it enough to make the compelling case that everybody's going to switch? No, but it is something to keep in mind. And what is the audio like compared to analog? It's not as good as analog, but it's much better than D-Star. We'll we'll let you hear some in a in a couple of minutes. So, um, when you consider the fact that in that in analog, once you get into this area, the audio the audio quality starts dying dramatically with hisses and pops. Um, there are there are certain there are areas there are ranges <coughs> away from the repeater where you got better audio quality with the digital than you do with analog. But if you have full quiet in an analog, the audio quality is better. You know, I would say it's not an. I would say that with DMR, it's not a not. It's not significantly worse than analog, but it is noticeable. It's like it's like the difference between AM and single sideband. You know, just, just to show you how much I know about digital. Yeah. DMR is the new technology. Right. What do they have in the works coming up after that, and will that be compatible with it? There's nothing that I know of offhand other than people who are saying, well, why don't we just repurpose the old police P25s, APCO P25s, which is the digital standard for most police and public service. Those radios are, have been pretty expensive. Nobody has been making a big move to, to change that at all. So nobody's been making a big move to go to those things. The only people who've been going to, to the P25 are, are real hobbyists who say, yeah, I want to play with this stuff. John? But John, isn't that P25 also about 20 years old? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's nothing. They've come out with a new modulation system for it, which is so quick, you can't even read the, you know, the RF signal on it. Even, even the, uh, when they go to service them, they had to put digital receivers in the, the uh, equipment to mm -hmm. read it. Because you can't hear it. I'm not following. The, the the modulation, the new the P25 with the new uh, MP. I forget what the digital, yeah. what the modulation system is. But it's a new modulation system that Motorola came out with. That is so fast. You it you don't get an RF signal out of it. The RF is there, but it's so fast that you cannot read it with a standard uh, receiver. Yes, I've read about that. Yes, and, I know what you're talking about. And they, even the test equipment, yeah, they they can't read it on the test equipment. They have to put a digital receiver in on the test equipment in order just to see the signal. Oh, good. Okay. okay, but what's the likelihood that that's going to come down to the ham radio world? Well, everything soon? else has come down. <laughs> John, one of the other points to consider, uh, too, for discussion's sake, is the cost of the repeaters. When you're looking at Fusion yeah. P25 DMR, the cost of the repeater is much lower, even though Yasu is trying to buy their way in by reducing right. the cost. The, the, the DMR repeaters are about $1,800. Right now, Yasu is doing deals on the, on the Fusion repeaters for as low as $500. Uh, but that's but but their list price is up around three thousand, I think, or thirty mm -hmm. thirty five hundred. The Icon Icon was selling the D Star repeaters for a while at the five hundred thousand dollar range, but they're now selling at three thousand thirty five hundred. So the DMR repeaters are less expensive. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't I don't see that P25 is going to enter the, the ham radio world for a while because it's still too expensive. Do you see them all getting together on one particular system rather Me? than... Me? I'm not a... I, I mean, you're, you're asking the wrong guy. I'm, you know, I don't know enough about it, but no, I don't. Look, look at it. They've had years to get together on one system and they have it. Uh, D-Star got a, a decent traction in the marketplace and Yezu never turned around and said, okay, yeah, we're going to support D-Star. Despite the fact that D-Star was very popular, they came out with their own. D Yezu did not, Yezu had the opportunity to say, you know what, this DMR is taking off, let's, let's come out with Yezu, you know, with DMR. Instead, they came out with their own, this fusion. 
So it doesn't look like the vendors are going to do that. It's, 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 it's the equivalent in automobile terms of, of car manufacturers all requiring that you use their own gasoline. You know, you can't use each other's gasoline. You can't use right. standard spark plugs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't get it. I, I don't see how they think they're going to make money. I don't. S but then again, I you know I, I read some of the some of the um, ham radio communication boards and people talking about yeah we're going to get a fusion repeater. Well, how many you know how many users have fusion radios? Well, not, well, not many. Okay. I don't get it. I don't understand why the vendors think that they're that they're going to get enough traction, get enough business in any one proprietary system to really make it worthwhile. And that's what's got me confused. I mean, I'm young enough that I remember CW and AM. Right. And then when Silly Sideband came out, nobody's going to use that, but everybody went into the same system. Right. Now with the digital, I'm totally confused. And I don't know if I want to go to one or the other because will it be there tomorrow? Well, Again, I know very little about the digital equipment. Sing, single sideband is it's a technology. That, there aren't different ways of doing it. You can only say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the upper sideband and I'm going to use the lower sideband. But it's not as if you have different ways of, of generating that sideband that, that are incompatible with each other. Here, they've got the modulation. Um, actually, technique's not the, well, technically it is the modulation, come to think of it. They, they've, they've got the the encoding and the modulation is different, so the radios are not compatible with each other. I don't know which is going to win. D-Star took off for a while, it was a big deal, and then everybody started really getting used to it and saying, you know, this isn't very good. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's kind of stalled. It's stalled at a certain level of growth. Part of the reason why it's stalled is because the radios are expensive. Part of the reason why it's stalled is because, um, uh, um, the radio is not only very expensive, but the ICOM stuff isn't very good, or, or the hand, handy talkies anyway. Is there anyone around here that, that is talking on D-Star? Is there a repeater? Yeah, there's a repeater. There's a D-Star repeater in Norwalk. Mm -hmm. You get on, it's the same couple of guys, and uh, I, I heard a fascinating conversation about colostomies the other day, <laughs> tying up the repeater for over an hour and a half, <laughs> talking about colostomy, you know, Comparing their colostomy bags. I'm serious. I'm serious. And one of the problems with D-Star is that you don't really have control over what you're connected to. So, for example, the Norwalk repeater is usually connected to a certain reflector that, meaning a, a network of repeaters here in the Northeast, and you as an individual user can't say, okay, I, I don't want to listen to that network of repeaters. I want to shut it off and not be bothered by them, or I want to go to a different network, and you can't. So you, you turn it on, and there's a, you know, there's a couple of guys having an hour and a half conversation about colostomies, colostomy beds, and there's nothing you can do. You can't even have a local conversation. Mm. The other problem is, is you start to talk to somebody, and all of a sudden you get switched around, and they just... Well, D-Star still suffers from that, that dropping that R2-D2 problem a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's when the, the signal gets weak, but it's also about, uh, you talk to one person, and then all of a sudden you find yourself talking to somebody else. How did that happen? Yeah, I haven't experienced that. Before. I, I have. I mean, okay. Um, I guess we have to see what's coming out of Dayton this week. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I mean, a lot... Are you going to come make report on it? No, I'm not doing that. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the Chinese vendors uh, presented presented stuff at a, a big show in Shanghai two months, I think it was two months ago, and there were at least three vendors who claimed that they had DMR radios in the $150 price range. Mm -hmm. There's one that's saying they're going to come out with a radio that's D-Star and DMR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with DMR is that it uses that, uh, sorry, D-Star, the problem with D-Star is that it uses that proprietary chip, and um, and you've got to pay money, you know, you've got to pay a lot of money for it. now. They claim, one of the vendors claims they're going to do it without that proprietary chip. That they've written their own software that, that they claim does not um, infringe. infringe on the, uh, I forget whether it's a patent or a trademark on the software. Uh, they claim that it doesn't infringe on the, on the copyrights and the trademark, the copyrights. You know, we'll see what happens, whether the, the chip manufacturers go after them and try to sue them or not. 
there was a there was a time early on um, when people were writing their own software to do the D-Star, the what's called the codec, the encoding and decoding, um, and they were. And, and first of all, ICOM wouldn't let them on the D-Star network in the U.S. if you were not using an ICOM radio. And then secondly, uh, AMB said, AMB makes the chip, they started suing these guys who were writing their own software to try to prevent them from writing their own software. Now, I don't know if they're still doing that, but that's been a big problem in getting people to, to switch over, to getting people to go with D-Star, because you've got to buy that chip from AMB, and that chip is expensive. So when, when people say that ICOM, that D-Star is proprietary to ICOM, it's not. Any manufacturer can make a D-Star radio, but they have to buy the chip from AMBE. It's proprietary to AMBE. If AMBE goes out of business or decides to stop making that chip, you can have a real problem. But uh, anybody, Yezu tomorrow, could turn around and come out with a D-Star radio if they wanted to. Um, with DMR, it's all public standard. You can write your own software if you want. Um, you know, if, if, if Motorola stopped making those radios tomorrow, there's still five or six other vendors who can make them perfectly legally. Nobody can sue them and say, hey, this is proprietary. This is intellectual property. It's not. It's a, it's a public standard. So that makes people think that DMR is going gonna, is gonna to be successful. I don't know about Yezu Fusion where that stands in terms of, a, of using any proprietary technology. I don't know where that stands. Right, you're active in DMR now. Yeah. You're act you're involved with all of the systems or no of them. Would you recommend that John Q. Ham go out and get involved in digital yet, or would you recommend that they wait? Or what's your impression? I I think it's you know, if you want to play with a new technology, I think it's worth it. At a at a two hundred dollar price point I would do it. At a $700 price point for a Motorola rig, I wouldn't. Or $500 for a Hytera. At, at $150, $200, I decided to do it because I wanted to see what it was like. Here in Connecticut, we have a very nice network, which I'll show you in a minute. So we have really good coverage. If I was somewhere out in the Midwest where the coverage isn't as good, I, I don't know that I would that I would suggest doing it. At can, I, can I, in Greenwich, use my handheld and have good Coverage? There is a there is a, a DMR repeater in Westchester. Um, there's something some funniness about it where where they were they had it off the network for a while. I, I don't know. I, I can get you the name of whoever's running it, but it's it's in White Plains, or it's, at least the license says it's White Plains, uh, and you would get good uh, good coverage from it. John, um, you, I have my my. Um DMR hooked up to my uh, uh, tri-band uh, pole on my garage roof, mm -hmm. so yeah, I can work it through that. But with the with the whip, I didn't. Yeah, get not, not from Old Greenwich, right? Yeah. Where, what are you talking to? The Stanford repeater or the? Um, to, yeah, well, to any, I guess to the Stanford repeater because that's what you programmed yeah. me for. Yeah. And so, yeah, I can get there, no problem with with my external antenna, but not with not with the, the no, the not whip. with the no, not with the whip. I mean, not with just the not with not just with the that. rubber duck. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can hit the Stanford repeater from my house, but normally when I'm in the house, I have, I have that connected up to my comet or whatever I have on the house. Yes, time or whatever comet. Because it's you know that that way I can hit other repeaters. Um, I don't. I just don't know about the status of the Westchester repeater, the White Plains repeater, offhand. No, I'm asking about Greenwich. Uh, no, there's nothing in Greenwich at this point. Now, with an analog with a uh, rubber duck, I can hit the repeater here. Mm, I can't. I still. Either way, I've got to go through that. If you can hit the repeater here, the analog repeater with a with a with a rubber ducky, then you should be able to hit the uh, the DMR repeater. From where you are, I didn't realize that you could hit. Well, I'm, I mean, I've been around Greenwich and, and hit it. Yeah, I, I I ran some tests on the DMR repeater. Uh, I lost the signal around exit between exit three and four on I ninety five, 
I lost it between exits 30 and 29 on the, on the Merrill. Now, there are spots in Greenwich, there are spots in for uh, Westchester County Airport, I can hit the DMR repeater just fine. But when I'm on the Merritt, um, I can't hit it until I hit about exit 30. So it's, it's the, even though that antenna is 100 something feet above ground, and the ground at that point is two or 300 feet above sea level, because of the, the terrain, mm -hmm. there's lots of places where you just can't hit it. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, I mean, it's I would be fair as well. with everything, yeah. So. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's interesting because of the of the capabilities that we have with DMR um, in this state because of this Aries network when the Aries network is working. But we'll, we'll go through that. Um, all right. So, in theory, you get a longer battery life with DMR than some of the other digital modes because it spends more time listening than trans. You know, a lot more time listening versus the amount of time it spends transmitting. Uh, so looking at this, this is the Connecticut DMR. Well, this is this is these are all the DMR repeaters in Connecticut mm. at the moment. Okay, some of them are airy, some of them aren't. But that's a lot of repeaters. You have pretty good coverage, except maybe you know right up in this area. Um, there's uh, you know there's this isn't this isn't Connecticut obviously, but there's White Plains. There's something in the Bronx. One or two of them in the Bronx. There are a couple on Long Island, and um, depending on where you are, you can get you can get a pretty good uh, connection with those with those repeaters. Um, as I said, some of these are are uh, are Connecticut Aries. Some of these aren't. Most of them are Connecticut Aries. Norwalk, for example, is not. Um, I mean, basically, the ones. The ones with the black circle are Connecticut Aries. The ones, the empty ones like this, the Norwalk are, like this Norwalk are, are not Aries. Most of the Connecticut Aries, well, let me go to the slide. Th these are all the Connecticut Aries DMR repeaters. One of the nice things about them is that they are, most of them are connected up through what's known in Connecticut as the State Police Microwave Network. It's actually a state microwave network. It's used for Department of Transportation, State Police, a bunch of other services. It's known as the State Police Network because it was first started for them, so it, it, and it's still run by them, but it has that name, but you know, it's more than the State Police. It's a network of microwave towers. So if the internet goes down, those towers would presumably still be operating. Um, that's a nice feature in, a, in an emergency. The Connecticut Aries network is devoted to Connecticut Aries in the sense that they have the right to shut down whatever operations they feel they should shut down in an emergency. Contrary to, to, to misinformation that's been uh, distributed by, among other things, the American Radio Relay League, Connecticut Aries does not tell you who is allowed and who is not allowed to operate on that network. They're simply saying in an emergency, they're probably going to shut down a lot of the talk groups and, and, and focus the use on emergency operations. Um, but there's all sorts of misinformation about that. Somebody I know was up at the ARRL the other day. That's what the, the idiot at the front desk was telling them. And since this happened to be somebody from Connecticut Aries, uh, he raised a holy hell with the ARRL about this imbecile giving out bad information. He chewed the imbecile out right there in front of everyone. Actually stormed up to the president's office and was screaming at the president of ARRL, which is good because they're a bunch of imbeciles, as you know. Um, <laughs> ARRL. Here's a good ARRL story for you. Ernest gets an email from a woman in Lower Manhattan. I'm talking down in Chinatown, almost at the bottom of Manhattan. She was told to contact us. She was told by ARRL to contact us. Her husband has died, and she's got a lot of uh, ham equipment to sell. Why would ARRL tell a woman who lives in Lower Manhattan to contact a club in Connecticut? Because we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> you have the most money. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which is? That's a good question. Can I just clarify something? On, you said that the, the microwave backbone uh, will function when everything else goes down, but that's because microwave towers are all independently powered by uh, backup power, right? Right. Yeah. Well, well they, if the internet goes down, I mean, it's two things. One is the power. These towers all have backups. you know, hardened sites with backup power okay. and all that. That's but why. secondly, they're not dependent on the internet. Yeah. They operate. Um, How do the repeaters then the repeaters are on the internet. No, these repeaters are not on the internet. They're on the microwave relay system. How do they? How, so how do they get on that? They're connected there at the tower. Oh, so our repeater has a microwave link. Somewhere. Yes. Okay. There's a there's a state microwave link going into Sterling Farms, and they just connected it up. It's another IP address off of the. Um, um, the, the, the network patch on there. So um, it's very nice. Now, one thing you always have to worry about is if there's a big enough emergency that they really need to use ham radio for emergency communications, what are the chances that the state's going to say, you know, our microwave backbone is overloaded because we've got state, you know, transport and state police and, and all this other stuff using our system. Ham hey, radio, you guys have got to get off. So there is that, there is that issue. We, we're on this microwave backbone. If the internet goes down, we don't care. But are we really, 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 really sure that that microwave network will be still available to us in that kind of an emergency. And if you're using a backbone system, yeah. if somebody here is talking and somebody upstate is talking, is one going to get through? Uh, no, they're, they're they've, got, they've got quite a lot of capacity on it. On this, it's a very sophisticated time time division multiplexing system with multiple channels so on it. So it's not, not in effect linking the... No, it's, the not, it's not like the uh, uh, Pioneer Valley or some of those where, where they can link all these repeaters, but only one person can be talking at a time. Okay. And many conversations can be going on because at the same time, you could have 100 hams on there at the same time as every state police vehicle, as all the Connecticut marshals, as hundreds of Connecticut Department of Public Works or uh, Connecticut State Department of Transportation uh, vehicles are talking on it. Uh, so, plus, so it still acts as a local repeater? Well, our, the, each repeater is local, so right. even if the whole microwave network went down, you still have a local repeater. No, no, it, it still acts as, lo as a local repeater, so if somebody is talking on the next one up, it's not in the two or not? No, they're not interfering. Right. They're, now, there are talk groups like Connecticut Statewide. If two people are talking on Connecticut Statewide, that channel is in use. Okay. But there are lots of channels. We'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But that's no different than any re, than any repeater. You know, if there are two people talking right. on the repeater, there are two people talking on the repeater. You can't have another conversation at the same time. Um, well, and on a on a DMR repeater, you can have two conversations going at the same time independent conversations. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's that's the connect, the Aries network. Most of them are on that digital, are, are on that microwave backbone. A few of them are on the internet. Um, just as an example, this is the Aries network. These are all the Aries stations as of, uh, uh, actually as of uh, a couple, couple of days ago. I pulled this down a couple of days ago. So that's all the all the Aries repeaters. Um, in this area, there's a Bridgeport repeater, there's a, a Danbury repeater, there's obviously Stanford, there's New Haven, um, uh, and uh, um, Wilton. So that gives us a couple of repeaters. There's also there are also some repeaters in Connecticut it was called the New England Turbo Network and that's these these up here. It includes a, one in Bridgeport, a different repeater than the Aries repeater and one in Norwalk in this area. So that's 
there's a lot of there's a lot of DMR repeaters right now in Connecticut. Connecticut's gone big for DMR repeaters. Are there a lot of users of repeaters? There are. You can you can get a conversation most any time. There are a lot of people who uh, you know a lot a lot of people bought the two hundred dollar Connect systems. There's also a fair number of people who have gone with the, the Motorola and stuff like that. Um, all right. So DMR, this is a, a concept that a lot of people have problem with. DMR operates on talk groups. Think of a talk group as a big cable. Each talk group is a separate cable that runs around the world. And a network operator can plug into any one of those cables, into any number of those cables they want to plug into. So for example, there's this cable called Worldwide. And it's intended for people who want to talk worldwide. Okay? There's a cable called Connecticut Statewide. Anybody who wants to can plug into it. Now obviously, very few people outside of Connecticut plug into Connecticut statewide. You know, there isn't a lot of demand to talk in Connecticut statewide from Oregon or, or from London. Well, you could if you wanted to. So think of it as a bunch of cables. And each network can decide to plug into as many of these cables as it wants to plug into. Typically everybody plugs into worldwide. Uh, most, most of them in English speaking countries plug into worldwide English. Most of them in North America plug into the North America cable. There's a Northeast, there's a New England, Southern New England, Connecticut statewide. Um, in general, the Connecticut Aries repeaters are on the use, make Connecticut statewide available. The New England turbo repeaters make New England and Southern New England available. I'm sorry, make Northeast available. I, I said that wrong. Make Northeast available. No, I was right the first time. The, the turbos make uh, New England and Southern New England available. Both of them make Northeast available. If you go to the Norwalk repeater, you're not going to find Connecticut statewide because that's Connecticut areas. There's no reason why they can't. They just haven't. For a while, there was an issue. The, the person who was putting together the, the New England Turbo Network got pissed because Aries wanted to build its own network and didn't just want to go on his network. And he said, I'm not letting you guys on, on uh, New England and Southern New England. And Aries said, okay, well, fine. You can't have Connecticut statewide. But uh, that's been smoothed over. So we, we'll start seeing more um, uh, cross-fertilization of those talk groups. Now, are these separate channels on the radio where you turn a dial from one to the yes. other? Yes. Each is a separate setting on the radio. So okay. when you go to a, when you go on, on Stanford, for example, you could be on statewide and talk on statewide. You can be on Northeast and talk on Northeast. You can be on Worldwide English and talk on Worldwide English. Um, you know, depending you on could, how you set your radio. Depending on what, you know, right. which, which thing which you point. dial to. Okay. All right? There are some restrictions in terms of, remember there are two channels. So typically, Northeast will typically be on channel one. Local stuff like Connecticut Statewide will typically be on channel two. That's just kind of a standard that people have adopted. Local stuff like New England and Southern New England will typically be on channel two. Worldwide will be on channel one. But if you set it up and you're set up, you would have access to worldwide English on any of these, on any of these repeaters as long as the network operator decided to provide that access. So the repeater can only handle two conversations, but it can split it, send one to one network and one to the other? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's th that's right. Because, um, well, for example, you know, worldwide English is is a common one that's found around the world. Um, 
So it goes out through whatever routing it goes through to get to the to the big cable. It goes it stretches around the world. It's not really a cable. It's all you know. It's all internet. But see, I, I'm confused. Right. How could if you're going to a a a DMR? Um, what would you call it? Um, antenna? Yeah, a repeater. Repeater. It's saying, let's say you plug into um, into this Stanford repeater. Okay, Stanford group. And on there, you have all these choices. Right. So the choices are worldwide or North America. Are you saying that, to, I have such a hard time understanding this, that if you go to worldwide, you're talking worldwide. Mm -hmm. If you go to North America, you're just talking into North America, How do, right? Yeah. Okay, if you go to Northeast, it's just Northeast. Right. How does it, how does it do that? I mean, well, again, to think of it as, as a bunch of, think of it as a bunch of different cables, okay, running around the world. Yeah. I'm the repeater operator, I say, I want to, or I'm the network operator, I'm Connecticut Aries, I want to plug into the worldwide cable, and lots of people around the world plug into the worldwide cable. I also say I'm going to plug into the North America cable, so, and people people in the, in North America plug into the North America cable. So you're giving by by programming this to what you want, you're telling the repeater exactly the area that you want to target. Yes. What, when now remember, it's not the radio that's targeting it. It's the repeater. It, no, well, no, it's it's the connection coming out of the repeater. So a repeater is still a repeater. Let me make sure I'm using dry erase here. So, yeah, okay. Can you? Can somebody get the hit the light for a minute? John. Yeah. I hate, I hate to interrupt you. The young lady outside wants to know if she can come in and clean up. Um, I guess, is she, <laughs> as long as she's not going to vacuum. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, 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 fine. No, it's fine, okay. So, look, here's my repeater, and here's a couple of people talking on the repeater, right? Right. And, there, and here are those cables. Remember, it's not really cables, right? And this one is worldwide, and this one is North America. Whoops. North America, and this one is Connecticut statewide. So the cable would mean frequency in a sense. No. It's, it's the group. all internet. Network. We're talking about all internet network. Not, it's not going out by radio. So the worldwide goes to all the repeaters around the world. The worldwide can be, anybody can connect to any cable, basically. So everybody around the world connects up to worldwide. It's amazing because, you know, I was able to be in a spot where I'm here, I, I, I can't get good reception where I live, and yet when I'm walking around in my yard, yeah. um, I'm hearing people from Colorado talking to people in Utah, yeah. and they're as clear as a bell. Yeah. It's like, because my gosh. it's not coming to you by radio. The only radio is from the repeater to you. Right. The rest of this is, think of it as cables. Right. Okay? So when you click on worldwide, what you're saying is you're telling the repeater to take your signal that comes in and send it up to the worldwide cable and send it out on the worldwide you. cable. Now I understand. Okay. Thank okay. You. But does that mean only two two people can talk on the worldwide cable at one time? Well, just like any repeater conversation, you can have multiple people having a conversation, it, you can't really have multiple conversations on Worldwide. Mm -hmm. Because everybody who's on Worldwide is on Worldwide. So if I'm talking to you, and meanwhile Stan and, and Mike are having a conversation, you two are going to step on each other. Are there multiple if you, Worldwide channels, or should there be? There should be, and that will grow over time. Right now there are a couple of what are called TAC channels. The idea being, you go up to Worldwide, and you meet on Worldwide and you say, hey, let's have a conversation, we'll go to TAC 310. Okay, you go over to that channel, as long as that channel's not busy, mm -hmm. and you two have a conversation, and what leave. Is TAC, what is TAC? 
it's tactical. Uh, in the in the in in public service, tactical channels are channels that are used for specific purposes, okay. specific conversations, okay. as opposed to general call channels. So eventually, that's going to have to happen. Otherwise, it's just going to get crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, people are having conversations on worldwide, having conversations on North America, having conversations on Northeast. Mm -hmm. 